We're in Ruth chapter 3, and if you want to turn there in your Bibles or swipe there on your devices, uh, just do a little, tiny little bit of review if you're here for the first time. Uh, we do study through these books like this verse by verse, so chapter by chapter. Next week, we'll ch do chapter 4. In chapters 1 and 2, what we learned was uh, there was a man named Elimelech in Bethlehem. Bethlehem means house of bread, and there had been a famine in the house of bread, no bread in the house of bread. So Elimelech and his wife Naomi and their two sons Malan and Kilion went away to Moab to sojourn there. That's a temporary term. It means they're going to go there for a while. They just needed, uh, because of the famine, that's why they, they left. And they went to Moab about 60 miles to the south and east, just on the other side of the Dead Sea. Those of you who have been to Israel, we drive right by this as we, as we drive down the highway uh, paralleling uh, the Jordan River. Um, and you can, you can look over to the other side and, and see what would have been the area where the Moabites lived. While there, Elimelech dies, sadly, and so Naomi is a widow. Uh, her two sons marry Moabite women, and um, one named Orpah, one named Ruth. And then after 10 years, Malan and Kilion die, and so Ruth is now uh, not only a widow, but she's, her, her two sons are gone, so she's vulnerable, she's weak. And along the way, she hears that the Lord had visited his people in Bethlehem. And that's just a phrase, a way that they would describe the fact that God had come and brought some blessing again to that area in Bethlehem, some food. So they decide they're going to go back. And the two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, decide they want to go with Naomi. Along the way, I don't know how far they walked together, but uh, Ruth, I mean, Naomi kind of comes to the point where she goes, no, no, girls, ladies, you need to stay here in your own land. It's probably better for you just culturally and in every other way. It would have been smarter for them to probably hang right there on a practical sort of wisdom, sort of just practical thinking. And Orpah goes back to <clears throat> her people, but Ruth remains with Naomi. They come into Bethlehem. There's a big buzz. Is that, is that Naomi? Is that, is that Naomi? That, just, that looks like Naomi, you know, because it's not a big city. You know, it's, it's, when it's called the city of Bethlehem, we need to kind of pare that down a little bit. It's more like a village to us, and a lot of people would have known her, recognized her. And uh, so they come back, Naomi and Ruth. Uh, Ruth is uh, fairly uh, industrious and takes some initiative, and she wants to go out and glean in the fields. The Jews had a, a, a sort of a mandate from God that if they were harvesting their field, they were to leave the perimeter of it for the poor to come and take those, uh, the leftovers, the gleanings, if you will. And so Ruth isn't just looking for a handout. She's willing to go work and do the hard work of harvesting those gleanings that are left in the perimeter. She just by happenstance, some of your English translations will say, in the Hebrew it's actually her chance chanced to come upon this field that belonged to one named Boaz. She doesn't know who he is, um, but Naomi would have, but Naomi's not there with her. And so um, Boaz takes note of her, they have a conversation, and it goes pretty well, and um, he uh, sees her as someone who he wants his employees to be generous with, and so he instructs them to do that sort of thing. Um, she goes home with just a ton of grain, home to wherever Naomi is and she are staying, and she's got this sack full of grain, you know? And Naomi's just, oh, awesome, you know, and, 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 and they're kind of blown away. It's probably enough food for a couple of weeks. They stay the duration there of the barley harvest and the wheat harvest, which is probably seven to eight weeks, period of time maybe between sort of mid-April and early June, and they, Ruth continues to work through um, the uh, harvest time. Uh, there's no indication as uh, Boaz and Ruth are interacting much more after that. I'm um, not sure why, uh, but uh, along the way, we kind of we pick up the fact that it, it, things have gone well at, as we closed out chapter 2, um, that she lived with her mother-in-law. Ruth lived with Naomi there, and the idea is she continued to work. So we pick up in chapter 3, and let's just, we're going to refer back a little bit as we go, because chapter 3 is one of the quirkiest chapters in the Old Testament. It's uh, a chapter that some might read on the surface and say, conspiracy, manipulation, even seduction. Um, but I think it is really rich. This is a beautiful jewel of a book. And um, I'm just blown away by the depth of commitment, uh, faithfulness, love that's on display here. And um, especially 
uh, a faithful God to be at work providentially in our lives when we oftentimes don't think he is or don't know he is. Uh, I'm pretty convinced when we get to heaven, we're all going to look back and go, oh, oh, the whole time you were watching over him. Oh, that whole time. I just didn't know, you know? And yet he's always there. Verse 1 of chapter 3, Naomi, her, her mother-in-law, said to her, meaning Ruth, my daughter, shall I... And notice that she calls her her daughter, not my daughter-in-law. I mean, they're really, their hearts are really knit together. There's that beautiful section, that verse that a lot of us know from chapter uh, 1 where she says, um, uh, I'm going to go where you go. Your people, my people. Your God, my God. It's that short, that brief, that sort of, you know, pithy and straight ahead, you know. And I think that maybe was Ruth's conversion moment to come to believe in Yahweh, to leave the land of Chemosh, the God of the Moabites, the God that some of the Moabites sacrificed their children to, to try to placate or assuage the anger of or try to in some way um, uh, manipulate Chemosh to give them a good crop or whatever it might be. But now she's coming to the land of Yahweh and Yahweh's people. And we see her turning to come to faith, really, in Yahweh. And Along the way, Naomi is just really very, you know, very much loves her daughter-in-law, calls her my daughter. Shall I not seek security for you that it may be well with you? Now, this is the same Hebrew word that um, in Hebrew, or excuse me, in, um, in chapter 1, verse 9, when she's praying for Orpah and for Ruth, she wants them to have security. Some of your translations will say rest. And it's a beautifully rich word, isn't it? Um, I don't know if your soul ever feels tired just exhausted from the deconstruction in the world around us or the disorderedness of the world around us, um, the angst of all of that that is just wrong. And, and we, I think we all long for the day when um, justice rolls down like a mighty river, when the Lord sets things right. And I love that about the Christian faith and the God of the Bible. He desires rest for us. He himself is our rest in the personal work of Christ. But here we see Naomi desiring that still for Ruth, as she did in chapter 1. She still wants that same thing. Shall I not seek rest or security for you, that it may be well with you? Now, is not Boaz, our kinsman, he's our relative, could mean acquaintance as well, but I'm pretty sure they're related from the overall story and what we learn here. Now, is not Boaz, our kinsman, with whose maids you were. And so, yes, Ruth has been working with Boaz's maids out in the fields. Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight, says Naomi. And I don't know, did she go online and Google the work schedule for the field that night to see who's on, you know, at the threshing floor tonight? And this is where they would pound out the grain, separate it from the chaff by throwing it up. The evening wind or breeze would come along and the, the chaff would be blown away and the, the grain would fall to the threshing floor and then be piled up. And basically, she's saying, I'm pretty sure Boaz is on the schedule for tonight. And wouldn't it be awesome for you to go and sort of run into him? You know, basically, it's kind of a that thing. Um, wash yourself, therefore. Anoint yourself. Put on your best clothes. Now, this is always good dating advice. Um, you know, if you're interested in dating, and, and for some of you that, that you're already married, this is still good advice. <laughs> All right, so, um, yeah, take a shower, comb your hair, brush your teeth. Some of you guys, if you just, you know, anoint yourself. Put some deodorant on. <laughs> Spritz yourself a little. And then the clothes here. Well, she might have been wearing still... Uh, the widow's mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, mourning clothing. And it would have been indeed a very public statement for her to not wear those anymore, to say, I'm no longer a widow in grieving and in mourning, but I'm now a woman, and I'm now a woman who's moving forward in my life. And that would have said something to somebody like Boaz in their day and in their time. So Naomi, being just real generous with her practical wisdom, says, well, <laughs> clean, clean yourself up, um, put on some perfume, head down there in your best clothes, and go to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. That sounds a little like, you know, if the way to a man's heart is through his stomach, um, it's don't get between a man and his food. Don't get between a man and his beverage. I'm not sure that's actually the case, but I think maybe the timing of what will happen, what kind of disposition of heart and mind he may be in at the end of a meal, 
uh, is actually a good thing. In other words, don't, don't sort of interrupt the whole social interaction thing. And it should be that when he lies down, you will take notice of the place where he lies. And you should go down and uncover his feet and lie down, and then he will tell you what you shall do. This, again, this all starts to sound weird to our modern ears. You know, what, what, what's that about? Uncover his feet. You know, I mean, I don't know about you guys. Have you watched on TV? Have you seen all these toe fungus commercials lately? <laughs> What is that about? What's going on in our world that toe fungus is like so important? You know, I so said, uncover his feet, right? And then lie down next to his feet like this. We'll talk about that in a second, what, it, what it's all about. And he'll tell you what you should do. She said to her, uh, Ruth responds to Naomi and says, all that you say I will do. I, I, I really love the relationship between these two. It's, it's, it's beautiful, you know? Daughter-in-law to mother-in-law, mother-in-law to daughter-in-law. It's not, it's, so often there can be bickering and, and sort of angst between those two positions, and yet not here at all. She went down to the threshing floor, Ruth did, and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. Um, why, why, why is he doing that? This is a wealthy man. Um, He's lying down at the mound of grain on the threshing floor. Well, a lot of good practical reasons back in their day and in their time. Thieves and robbers would easily have wanted to come and take that grain. Uh, animals might have come and fed on that grain. And so somebody needed to be the guard or the watch through the night. Now, typically with a guy this wealthy, you would think one of his hirelings would do that. But in the providence of God, that which some see as accidental is actually providential. Uh, maybe somebody who was supposed to be scheduled that night couldn't be there. Somehow or another, Naomi knows about it, and she's sending daughter-in-law Ruth down there to interact in some way with Boaz. But it's surely to a lot of us, it kind of sounds like a strange way to interact, uncover his feet and lie down there. What happens? Uh, see what happens. In the middle of the night, the man was startled and bent forward, and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. Now, how many of you go camping? Anybody ever go camping here at all? Some of you do? I'm not a camper. My idea of camping, Kim and I, our idea of camping is the Hampton Inn, okay? So it's like, let's just go there and, you know. But I did once when I was in high school. I lived in Northern Virginia there in Falls Church, and uh, one of my buddies, Bob DeGroote, and I in high school, we decided we're going to camp out. And, you know, just it sounded like something we needed to do, you know, just something on the box that teenage boys need to do. So we did, and we put a pup tent out in the backyard, and we had our, we had our sleeping bags, and it was awesome, you know. We went out there, and, you know, finally convinced my mom to let us do it. We're, you know, it's, it's really dark out there. It's kind of cold. We've got the sleeping bags, and, and, of course, we're just talking on into the night, really late at night, finally drift off to sleep. Somewhere in the middle of the night, I actually felt something weird, and, I, and it was in, in, at my head. I mean, like, I went like this, and I, uh, and I felt something really slimy and gross in my hair, and it startled me. I'm out of the sleeping bag. I'm out of the tent. I'm, like, knocking the tent over, trying to get out of it, and there was a slug traveling through my hair. <laughs> so gross. Now, I don't know what it means that Boaz was startled awake because, I mean, is it because his feet were cold? Or is it because there's some warm something or another down there, human person, you know, what, ah, what is that? But it's certainly shocking, and he, he, he's sort of abruptly awakened, you know, and, he, and he's going to say, you know, what's going on? Who, who are you? And she answered, verse 9, I am Ruth, your maid. That's a beautiful way to answer this. So spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. Now, man, without understanding some of what's going on here, um, this sounds strange to just anybody at all. Um, the word that is used here for your covering is the same exact word. Turn back one chapter to chapter 2, verse 12. When Boaz meets Ruth... Um, and he sees what a quality individual she is, what a person of integrity she is. Um, he notices her. He, he takes note of her. And he, um, he says in verse 12, this prayer of blessing on her. By the way, all, in, in the book of Ruth, 
all of the prayers are prayers of blessing. And in the book of Ruth, all of the prayers are answered yes. They are blessed in the way that they were prayed to be blessed for. So verse 12, may the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord. And Boaz saying this over Ruth is actually saying Yahweh, the name of God, personal name of God, not, not the title God, uh, not Elohim, not Adonai, not Shaddai, but his personal name, Yahweh, to a Moabite. May Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, bless you, you outsider, Moabite woman, you vulnerable widow who's come from a far distant land. You've left your land. You've left your people. Uh, may the Lord bless you, he says. It's really beautiful, reminding us our God's reach is not limited by one people group or one race or one border of some zip code. The reach of grace is limitless. He can go anywhere and save anybody that he wants to. Salvation belongs to him. May the Lord reward you for your work and your wages from under the Lord, Yahweh, now the God of Israel. And then here's where I want you to look. Um, who, under whose wings, I love that word, it's beautiful, uh, you have come to seek refuge. Now the word wings there is the exact same words that we have in verse 9 of chapter 3 for covering. In the Hebrew it's kanaf, and may the wings, she's essentially saying to Boaz, I would like your wings to cover me, just as you prayed for me that the wings of Yahweh would bless me and cover me, would you be the answer to your own prayer? Would you allow Yahweh to work through you to be my covering? This is the same word, kanaf, that's used by Ezekiel the prophet in chapter 16, verse 8. When Yahweh, speaking about a very wayward, very rebellious, uh, idol-worshiping Jerusalem, where God says to them that he will spread his wings over them, and they will, he will renew his covenant with them, and they will be his. And so what she's actually doing in verse 9 of chapter 3 is she's saying to him, marry me. And not only marry me, but be our kinsman redeemer, it says right here, uh, for you are a close relative, a kinsman redeemer. And essentially what she's boldly asking for is for Boaz to redeem the whole situation, her life, her, her mother-in-law, Naomi, the fallen Elimelech, Malon and Kilion, their land. It's all of a piece here in, in the way that the Jews would think, in their customs and in their culture to be the kinsman redeemer, buy back the land, buy back um, uh, the, 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 even our, those that will be our descendants. Um, it's amazing, ask here on her part to say that in a cold night to a guy who just was startled awake. And, uh, and so she asks this, and then he says, look at his response, may you be blessed of Yahweh, my daughter. You have shown your, la your last kindness, or your chesed, your, and this is a word that has been throughout the book as well, your, um, your covenant faithfulness, your loyal love. This is the kind of love that God loves his people with. Your, this, this time, her ask, he understands her ask. See? You're blowing me away with the faithfulness of your heart and the boldness of your ask. In this particular case, he says, you're amazingly faithful to your mother-in-law. You're amazingly faithful to your dead father-in-law and to your dead husband and to the line that you would like to see fall from them. Notice how it goes on. To be better than the first by not going after young men, whether poor or rich. In other words, he, Boaz, is probably an older guy. She, Ruth, is probably a younger woman. And she's not been necessarily just attracted to him because he's an older guy and looks so distinguished with that gray beard. No. For her and for them, even in their day, you know, often their marriages were arranged. It wasn't about being swept off your feet by some Hallmark card, you know, image of some person. It wasn't about m magnetism or sort of, you know, um, uh, being attracted physically, and that's, that's where it all starts and ends. 
Um, not that way at all for them. So he is blown away by her, her faithfulness, her covenant love, I think for Naomi as much as for uh, the way he's, he's come to him. Uh, you, you, did, you could have gone for a younger man, but you didn't whether poor or rich. Now, my daughter, do not fear. There it is. I will do for you whatever you ask for. All my people in this city know that you are a woman of excellence. You're a woman of excellence. The same Hebrew word that's used to describe Boaz in chapter 2, verse 1. I love this about the way they are paired. They are both people who are men. Of, he's a man of excellence. She's a woman of excellence. Same um, descriptive. Descriptor is used for both of them. Um, and yet their ages are pretty far apart. And yet here she is um, laying down her life, not only for herself, but also for Naomi, also for the heritage and the, the, the line of, of Elimelech and for Malon and Kilion as well. Now, it's true that I'm close rel relative, he goes on to say. Here's a little bit. Of, just when you think the storyline, everything's good. They're going to walk off into the sunset together holding hands, and, and everything's going to be awesome. Okay, there's a little wrinkle here, all right? Look at what, the, look what happens. It's true that I'm a close relative. However, there's a relative closer than I am. Remain this night, and when morning comes, if he will redeem you, good, let him redeem you. But if he does not wish to redeem you, then I will redeem you as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. Now, by the way, I don't know if you noticed this, but the word redeem has occurred seven times in verses. If you add verses 9, 12, and 13 together, you get seven times the word redemption is involved. This God of the Bible in preserving this text for us, just reminding us all the time, he's a God of redemption. The story of the Bible is the story of a God who redeems and makes redemption possible. It's just being foreshadowed so beautifully and reflected so beautifully here in these human relationships, in this very real relationship. But he's going to say to her, um, there's another one who's actually first in line and has the right to do this before me. And so stay here, I mean, and he's, I know what's happening in this guy. He's, he's like some of you, and he's like me, in the sense that all night long now, his mind is going to be going, he's going to be thinking of this thing, and watch what happens, so he comes up with. So she laid his feet until morning, verse 14, and rose before one could recognize another. What that means is before light, before you could see somebody and recognize them. So she gets up really early. Um, and he says to her, let it not be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. He's careful about her, her um, reputation socially. Um, and, and he ought to be. I think that's good. Even if there, this other kinsman redeemer were to hear that Ruth had spent the night on the threshing floor with Boaz, um, boy, they, it could wreak havoc on her uh, image, her reputation, and all that sort of thing. Um, and so... Again, he said, verse 15, give me the cloak that's on you and hold it. So she held it, measured six bar measures of barley and laid it on her. And, and in other words, he, he lifted it up for her and, and she either put it on her head or, or somehow or another over her back or whatever. And she went into the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, that's Naomi, she said, how did it go, my daughter? So Naomi, Naomi says, how did it go, my daughter? Some of your Bible translations will say, who are you, my daughter? Did she not recognize her own daughter? No, she's asking her, you know, she knows that Ruth was going to meet with Boaz, and she knows that um, both of them are people of integrity. This is no walk of shame. But she's wondering how it went, and are you now Boaz's wife? Has he proposed to you? Is something going to change? Um, Ruth the Moabitess is now Ruth the Bethlehemite, perhaps. And so she's asking that question. How, how did it go, essentially? She told her all that the man had done for her. And she said, these six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said, do not go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Now, all you married men, underline that command right there, okay? <laughs> this is, if you're married, do not go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. This is good advice. Again, just good old practical advice. Um, uh, I, you know, just a personal note. I chose my mother-in-law before I chose my wife. It's kind of crazy, I know. But uh, Anne, who's home with, home with the Lord, just the sweetest lady, awesome, great friend of mine, uh, um, before Kim and I ever dated, you know. And so I love the relationship between Ruth and Naomi, how she loves her mother-in-law so much. But so here comes this advice from Boaz, don't go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. And I think that's because uh, Boaz wants Naomi to know 
yeah, I'm, I'm going to work to be your kinsman redeemer, and it's not just I'm going to marry your daughter-in-law. This is, I, I mean kinsman redeemer in the fullest sense, Naomi, and I've, I'm going to take care of you as well. How wonderful that would be for Ruth and Naomi. They both cared so much for each other. How wonderful that Boaz uh, had that same disposition of heart toward in other words, when he marries Ruth, he's going to get a mother-in-law as well. He's also going to have to purchase this land. Um, it's just a fascinating relationship. Then she said, wait, my daughter, and this is, this is Naomi to Ruth, wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest until he has settled it today. So Naomi knows Boaz. She knows Boaz to be a man of action, and uh, he's decisive, and he's also a guy who's probably been thinking all night long about how he's going to do this thing, how he's going to plan this thing and work this out. Because there is another person who's a closer relative and who's first in line. So what do we learn here? Well, three things I want to point out for you real quick. One, the God of the Bible is in the redemption business. This is huge. Um, some form of that word redemption, seven times in those three different verses, 9, 12, 13. It means to save, to set free, to buy back, to purchase. There's a lot of different ways. Uh, it could be described, but um, Boaz is going to buy back their peace, their security, in answer to the prayer of God, uh, or excuse me, the prayer of Naomi for Ruth. Um, he's going to answer, he's going to become the answer. I thought to myself, man, what would it be like if all of the people who call themselves Christians, all the people who are followers of Jesus, started praying, Lord, let me be, I'm going to pray for this in my world or this in my relationships, but Lord, show me how I can be a part of the answer to this prayer as well. Some of you are praying for someone who's difficult to love. Pray for yourself too. You know, I, I, when I pray for people who are difficult to love, I'm usually praying that the Lord will change them. <laughs> but pray too that the Lord will change yourself, you as well and the way that you love them that you will be a part of the answer to that prayer in any way that God would have you to be. I think that's a, another thing we can learn from this. But God, it, the God of the Bible is in the redemption business. This is not a God that simply has rules for you to follow or simply Jesus as an example for you to follow. Because I don't know if you know this or not, but none of us can actually follow Jesus completely. He was perfect. He was sinless. That's what made him qualified to go to the cross and take my sin with him and die on the cross with my sin. It, because he didn't have to go to the cross and die for his sin. So he, he's qualified to take my sin and to take your sin with him to the cross. And that's wonderful. That's why he can be my Savior and be your Savior as well. How wonderful that he would do that for us. He becomes the solution to our problem himself. We cry out for salvation, we cry out for forgiveness, but it's through Christ that that is actually accomplished, the ultimate kinsman redeemer, and he, the God of the Bible, indeed is in that business. I love the way Brendan Manning said, unbounded trust in the merciful love of the redeeming God deals a mortal blow to skepticism, cynicism, self-condemnation, and despair. Do you struggle with any of those things today yourself? You know, despair. I mean, I imagine these ladies at some point on some number of different days had some real difficult times with, with despair. Maybe with doubt, maybe with struggle. Is Yahweh really listening? As, as Ruth goes out over that seven-week period and works really hard every single day, not looking for a handout, but willing to go and take just the gleanings, the leftovers from, the, from those fields, something God had provided for a long, long time ago when he told his people to leave those perimeters you know, available for the poor and for the widow as well. And um, some of us struggle with skepticism, cynicism. This is something I wrestle with. Maybe you do as well. Um, uh, I've had friends that have moved to Nashville that have asked me uh, several different times, several different friends, what do I need to watch out for when I move to Nashville? And I say cynicism uh, because that's my problem. Right? So I just tell them what my problem is. For me, cynicism is a fruit of arrogance. I think I know better. I think I've already heard that before. So I kind of shut down or I turn it off or don't listen or don't sit up straight and pay attention. I've already heard that. I don't need that. Or I think I can do better. I see somebody, somebody advancing or getting an opportunity and I think, oh, I, I could have done that. 
my cynicism kicks in because it's a fruit of my arrogance and it's ugly. Um, and I'm so glad that unbounded trust in the merciful love of redeeming God deals a death blow to sin skepticism, cynicism, self-condemnation, and despair. I also think it deals a, a mortal blow to, my, to my, uh, my good deeds, my good works that I sometimes think earn me cred with God. Um, his grace simply washes all that out. There's, you, know, it's, you just have to throw yourself at his grace and his mercy. And the great news is he, he already knows what a sinner I am, and he completely loves me in spite of the fact that I'm a sinner. Same with you as well. It's our decisive yes to Christ's command, trust God and trust in me. I think Manning was right on about that. Secondly, I think we see in this chapter, faith and action go hand in hand. Boaz, even Naomi said, he is not going to rest until he gets this thing done today. I mean, he's a man of action. He really is. Probably why he's a wealthy man. Probably why he's, you know, a, a, a man of integrity. He's decisive. He knows where north is on the compass. Culture that we live in right now is um, intellectually confused and morally bankrupt. A person of integrity, of character, is a rare find in our day and time. Um, seek to be that, though. Lay yourself before him, the one who is the fountain, the source of discernment, wisdom, and all of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, and peace. These are fruit of the Spirit, not fruit of Jim, not fruit of going to the village chapel. These are the fruit of the Spirit at work in your life. Uh, surrender to him. Faith and action do go together, though, and I love to see this. I love that Naomi goes, all right, here's what you do. I got it. little perfume. Take a shower, clean it up, get it down there. He'll be down there. It'll, you have a good opportunity to run into him, you know. I, mean, I love that, that planning. That's awesome. Uh, Ruth was faith in action in, in combination as well. She went out and worked in the fields every single day. She didn't wait around for the phone to ring, you know. She's not waiting around for opportunity to come her way. She goes out and makes it happen. Very proactive, these people. I love that. But yet also people of great faith in Yahweh. May his blessing be upon you. Naomi would pray for Ruth. Boaz would pray for Ruth. Ruth would say, his favor is upon me. And she just marvels at it all. You know, the way Yahweh has been so beautifully, wonderfully gracious to her. Ravi Zacharias, the grandeur of the gospel strikes deep into the soul of wickedness because it offers not merely an analysis of the condition nor just the strength to do what is right. It goes to our innermost being where the work of God changes what we want to do. So our wanter is broken. It needs to be fixed or redirected. And this is the beauty of the gospel. Reorders and redirects our wanter. Um, uh, this is not an ethical system calling us to civility. This is the transforming work of the grace of God who then deigns to call us his children. And I'm so glad that he does. You are his son and his daughter if you have placed your hope and your faith and your confidence in Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is at work in your life, in your heart. Um, do not give up trusting him to do that work. If you have difficult people in your life, difficult people to love, or if you're struggling with some of your own difficult, you know, habits or addictions, vulnerabilities or weaknesses, don't give up. Keep trusting him. Keep going to him time and time and time again. He is at work in you, and it's his uh, power that will transform each and every one of us. Thirdly and finally, the biblical relationships reflect a sacred faithfulness. That's what we see here in chapter 3 and really throughout the entire book. Um, biblical relationships reflect a sacred faithfulness. In our world today, uh, love is defined more and more and more um, in the category of feelings. Um, so people talk about making love. And what they're really doing often without any kind of commitment or promise is they're faking love. They're just doing what animals do at that point without the covenant promise. Uh, don't, don't use somebody that way. And don't allow yourself to be used that way. Okay? Um, uh, God's people know that real love, sacrificial love, where you actually lay your life down for the highest good of another, 
And this is exactly what Jesus has done. And God's people know that. And you see that what Christ has done. And you see that it's not only an act of self-sacrifice, but it's, a, it's an act of beauty and of grace. Because we're undeserving. He's done this for us in spite of the fact that we're undeserving. He's come on the run with rescue for rebels and runaways. And that's who we are. And we see this so beautifully displayed. And here's, here's this older guy who's got some wealth, who, who really, I believe, starts to see that Yahweh has ordained this whole thing and God in his providence has brought about all of these happenstance meetings and he's going to now work to become the answer to this prayer uh, to be uh, the kinsman redeemer uh, for Ruth and for Naomi and for the line of Elimelech and it's a really beautiful thing biblical relationships reflect a sacred faithfulness that faithfulness is sacred because it's the kind of faithfulness that God has shown toward us in Christ um, redeeming us we who are outsiders he has welcomed in and he's made it possible for us to come in not based on the fact that we're good southerners or or religious people or village chapel people but because of what Christ has done himself the way he has bought us back he has paid the price for us. I'm so glad the God of the Bible is that way, that he's in that kind of business of redemption because I need redemption. We believe the gospel. For us, this means that sacrificial love, the kind of love that Jesus had for us, is not just our duty, but it's our delight, David Platt said in Radical Together. So we're the people of God, and we want to reflect the heart of God. We pray often around here in one of our calls to worship. We say, Lord, give us your eyes that we might see what you see. Give us your heart that we might want or delight in what you want and what you delight in. We want that to be true of our relationships, the way we work, the way we create, uh, the way that we are sons, the way we are daughters, the way we are husbands and wives, whatever. Uh, uh, we want God to be glorified in our lives, and we want to delight in His ways and in His will in our lives. Eugene Cho is a pastor in Seattle of a church called Quest. He said, um, as it relates to the community of faith, dear Christian, make a commitment to your local church. Be a host rather than a guest. Don't just consume, serve, engage, give, pray, love. I love how pithy that is. I love how to the point that is. And yes, church, when you come here, you know, how many people leave churches, you know, because wow, they just weren't feeding me. Hey, look, don't go to a church that just feeds you. Go to a church that makes you hungry for more of God, makes you hungry to serve more. Go to that kind of church, okay? Um, uh, and this cons the word consume is there either. So don't just consume. I love, that's beautiful too. We pray that when you come in here, you're not, we don't see you as consumers, we see, we, but we, we're looking to become communers communing with God, communing in the fellowship of saints with one another um, because of what Christ has done for each and every one of us. And we are a strange group, aren't we? You know, I'm looking out here and I'm just seeing the diversity of, you know, of who we are and I love this. You're sitting next to somebody you probably don't agree with on a lot of things and, um, and, and you're sitting next to people or in front of people or behind people that have completely different life experiences than you do and yet in Christ... We have found our identity, our common identity in Him, in His redeeming power at work in our lives. And so we come to say thank you to Him each and every Sunday, to praise His name each and every Sunday, uh, to, to pray uh, for and ask for His grace to be afresh and anew at work in our lives each and every Sunday, and to remind each other of the things that really matter, the gospel, um, this glorious, amazing good news that through Jesus Christ and his sacrificial death on the cross, you and I can be reconciled with a holy and righteous God. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for being our Redeemer, our kinsman. You became one of us. Our Redeemer, you sacrificed yourself that we might benefit, that we might receive salvation and be reconciled to God. This is amazing to us, Lord. We have no perfume. We have no clothes that are going to be good enough. We can't impress you in any way. And yet you've set your love on us. This is amazing, Lord. Here we have seen reflected in this beautiful, lovely chapter that you've preserved for us over time, um, the way that you love us. Lord, send us out now into the world to love in a similar manner. 
yeah, that the gospel might fall freely from our lips, that the gospel might be visible in our relationships and in our lives, and the way we conduct ourselves, and the way that we honor you, uh, not only with our belief, but also with our behavior. Be glorified in your people, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.